Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. reference the I didn't say anything important so far. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so the talk will have two parts. And I'll try to devote about the same amount of time to each of these two parts. Um, in the second part, I will talk about stochastic packing, which, is, uh, which can be seen as a stochastic generalization of packing integer programs, which is a well-known uh, concept in combinatorial optimization. And in particular, I will try to mention two results here. Uh, one that's uh, related to the general problem of stochastic packing without any restrictions, and then a more specific problem of stochastic set packing, where we have uh, tighter results. And if I have time at the end, I will mention some results about the computational complexity of these problems. So let me start by defining the stochastic knapsack problem. So the knapsack problem is a well-known problem where you have some items with sizes and values, and you would like to choose a subset of these items in order to maximize the value that you get. Without what is the word knapsack? Means knapsack is a German word. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> Very it's, a, it's a German word that needs a backpack, basically. It's a backpack. Um, so actually, I'm not sure about the etymology of this problem, but I wouldn't like to waste too much time on this. No, but I think Roman wants to know what the knapsack problem is. Oh. He doesn't know that No, no, I wanted to know what this knapsack is oh. about, but okay. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not so sure. Uh, okay. I will. It's a backpack. Okay, okay, enough, enough. <laughs> sock exists, but nap doesn't. Oh, there's a book sock. Anyway, let's see. Yeah. I mean, sleeping bag. <laughs> Nap for napping. <laughs> yeah, it's a backpack problem. <laughs> where, <laughs> where, okay, but let me, uh, what, what's new here? Well, the new feature here is that the items have random sizes. That's what's new. So uh, I will motivate this in a moment. But first, let me describe the rules of the game here. So we have some items which have random sizes and deterministic values. And then we have a fixed deterministic capacity that we assume to be equal to 1. And the goal is to pack a certain collection of items within that capacity uh, in order to maximize the value, the total value that you obtain. And an important feature of this model is that before you choose an item, you don't know what the precise size will be. You only know something about the probability distribution. And the probability distribution can be different for every item. But once you choose and you put the item in your So they're backpack, not identically not distributed ident necessarily. No, not necessarily. These distributions are completely arbitrary. Mm. Um, but they are independent as random sure. variables. Different items are independent. 
Okay, but the rule is that when you choose the item and you put it in your backpack, then you know what the precise size of the item is. So it's like, well, once you select the item, you sample from the distribution and you fix the size, and th this will be the actual size that the item has. It seems sort of weird. I mean, I could see that that when I get an item to put in my knapsack, that you will only tell me how much you pay once I take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That so I only see how. No, big but what if he's getting jobs that he's going to put into something, well, and he draws something from a from a, like this class of jobs, that class of jobs, and only knows the distribution, right? Yeah. How do you know that? That's exactly. How do I know that? Well, I just made it up. So that's exactly <laughs> the motivation here. Maybe let me tell you the motivation first. <laughs> because, uh, but you know, all items are available already at the beginning. Yes, it's not online. It's, it's not an offline. Problem. It's, it's an offline problem in the sense that you have some information about everything. Oh, in but then, when you actually choose the item, you get more information. Specifically, you know precisely what the size will be. And uh, so let's look at the motivation first, because maybe that will make it clear. The motivation is a job scheduling problem where the items are jobs and the size means uh, processing time, all right? So before I run the job, I don't know exactly how much it will take to complete that job. But when I choose it and I run it, then I know exactly what, what the processing time was when it's completed. And then I can choose the next job based on that information, okay? So that, uh, this motivation uh, defines uh, the rules of our game which are spelled out here. Uh, maybe let me mention another important rule, which is pretty clear from the motivation, I'm sorry. That when you uh, choose an item which turns out to overflow the capacity, then you have to stop. Then you don't get any profit for that item, and you're not allowed to continue. You can say, OK, so let's try a different item. Okay? Once something overflows, then you're finished, and you don't get any more. About. Okay, the final objective function that we are interested in is the expected value collect. So it is like this card game, this 21 or whatever. You a play little, the cards and you shouldn't little, exceed. A little bit, yeah. 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 It's a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. The, uh, you put two items in at the same time. That's a specific case where the values are actually equal to the size, right? It's, uh, so the card game would be like a knapsack problem where we get a value that's equal to the random size, which is a little different because here we, we are not allowed to have random values. But it, it, it's a very similar. No, so I, I will come back to that later. No, but but in, in 20, if you overflow, you get zero. And here you don't get zero if you overflow. You get zero. You are. Oh, no, no. You no, no, you, you get, get the, the everything before up to the last item before. Uh -huh. That's true. Uh -huh. That's that's another difference. And you cannot uh -huh. preempt so if you completely see completely yeah. different. Because you cannot preempt if the job is running for a long time. You cannot throw it out and put no, no, no. another one. No, no, no. So that would be, yeah. In the in the job scheduling application, that would be realistic to allow that, but we don't allow that. It's like. You choose the item, and then you have it. So, uh, so that's the model. And well, the job set would be a nicer one if you choose it, and after it runs time e, you throw out. I mean, you could do. Yeah, you could introduce that in the model. But yeah. But you learn only afterwards. After you finish your job, you learn that it was over time. No, no, but if it's taking a really long time, you might say, oh, I'm, I'm worried about this. I wish that no, I want to throw it you out. You could do that, yeah. But it I would be a little a messy. In the, in the, like, um, yeah, probably harder to analyze that yeah. model. Uh, but the crucial uh, concept here is this, uh, that we can either allow uh, our algorithm to look at these items and decide, make the next decision based on the sizes that we have seen so far. Or we don't allow that. And these are two lever levels of power that we look at. So the first one uh, is what we call a non-adaptive policy, and that's very simple. That means we look uh, at the probability distributions of everything in advance, and we have to produce a complete solution. We have to write down a sequence of items that we insert. Uh, 
the second approach is uh, what we call an adaptive policy, which means that we insert them one by one, just as I uh, mentioned, and every time you can make the de next decision based on what you see. And for both of these uh, policies, uh, we measure the expected value that we achieve, and we try to maximize that. So let's denote by adapt the maximum possible expected value that we can achieve using an adaptive policy, and non-adapt is the maximum expected value that we can achieve using a non-adaptive policy. And the question is, uh, how much better can we get by being adaptive? That's the first question that we are interested in. And it's not very hard to find examples where you can do better by being adaptive. You can certainly use the information that uh, there is, you know, 0.1 space remaining, or time remaining, or 0.2 and schedule something for which you get more value. So, uh, so this is uh, some value greater than 1. Now, a priori, it's not even clear if it's always bounded, if it's bounded by some constant or not. So that's the first question. Um, another question is how can we actually find these policies algorithmically? So in these the definitions that I, that I mentioned here, these policies are uh, simply functions. You know, there's nothing computational here. These are just oracles. The, the, the adaptive policy can be seen as an oracle. The non-adaptive policy is just a sequence. So another question is how can we actually find these algorithmically? And then we have to say something about what information we have about these probability distributions. Um, I can tell you right now that actually all we assume about these probability distributions are the expected values. So we will only consider algorithms that get the input in such a form that you know the expected size of every item. Uh, more, more precisely, you know the expected size of the item uh, which is truncated at the capacity. So I will, I will define that. Let me summarize what we did um, in the last Fox. Uh, so there are examples, you can construct examples, where the adaptive policy gets uh, something like 1.25 times the expected value of the best non-adaptive policy. So that's a lower bound on what we call the adaptivity gap. There's a certain gap between being adaptive and non-adaptive, and it's at least 1.25. Um, and we haven't been able to improve this, which is a pretty simple example with three items. That's certainly one thing to look at, but we made more effort to prove some kind of upper bound, which is the more interesting question here. So in that paper in Fox, we proved that the adaptivity gap is always at most seven. I will say a little bit about uh, how we do that. Um, moreover, we we can design an adaptive approximation policy that approximates the adaptive optimum within five plus epsilon. But that's an adaptive policy, that's an algorithmic result. So that doesn't uh, prove an upper bound on the adaptivity gap, that's an approximation factor. Uh, furthermore, we have... This means that... Uh, let me see if I understand what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that you can... Uh, you have an algorithm running in pol polynomial time which is an adapt adaptive uh, approximation policy and gets within this ratio of the true best adaptive. Of the best adaptive <laughs> algorithm, even, even though we don't know <coughs> what that is. Mm -hmm. But okay. we can prove that it's within that factor. And actually, the factor 7 is also algorithmic in the sense that we design, uh, and actually that's a very simple non-adaptive policy which is within a factor of seven uh, of the best adaptive policy. And that proves the bound of seven on the adaptivity gap. Uh, then we have some p-space hardness results. Uh, I will say a little bit about that at the end if I have time. Uh, but here I will actually spend more time on showing how we prove much better bounds than the ones that appeared in the paper, namely, the adaptivity gap is at most four. That's the latest number that we got. The, the number keeps decreasing. 
from 7 to 6, 7 to 4.5, and now it's 4. Uh, but 4 seems pretty tight in a certain sense, that we can't improve that uh, under some assumptions on the method, methods that we use. And this is algorithmic? You so this is algorithmic, and it's a very simple algorithm. So uh, the progress here is not in designing smarter and smarter non-adaptive algorithms, but analyzing better what the optimum actually is. And analyzing better how much the, the non-adaptive algorithm gets. And I will, I will spend some time on that. Uh, yeah, it's a trivial, it's really a simple greedy algorithm that achieves at least one quarter of the adaptive optimum. And we improve the 5 plus epsilon to 3 plus epsilon. That's a side product uh, of the methods, of the new methods. OK. So let me say a little bit about the methods that we use. First, forget about values. And now uh, imagine that the value of each item is actually equal to the expected size. One technicality here is that we calculate the expectation of the size truncated at 1. This makes some sense because when the size is more than 1, it doesn't really matter. If it's 2 or a million, it doesn't matter. So we assume that the capacity is 1. And we cut everything at 1. And this will be. It is known in the sense, now I can make it more precise, uh, the probability distributions are known uh, exactly in that we know this mean value, this mu i. Is that all you're assuming about so them, all, that they're okay. finite mean? Or but what's the original problem for this? Finite mean, they should be finite mean. What's Actually, they, uh, Finite square, for example. But, uh, well, but no, what I'm asking is, is the proof going one. to require extra, um, extra assumptions on the probability distribution or not? I should say we need two things. We need this mu i, and then we need to know the probability that the item fits. We need to know the probability that SI is at most one. That's, so we need two pieces of information here. But I have still a question of the original problem setting. So it's the original problem setting. I mean, when you talk about adaptive algorithms, mm -hmm. are we supposed to, when we define the optimal adaptive strategy, do we know the probability distributions? So we know exactly this mu i. For each item, I give you. I mean, that sort of now fitting it into the proof. The answer is no. You don't no. know. You, you don't know. know. You, don't you have know. no idea about the probability. No. In, in the model, so like within, within this stochastic model, you can consider different levels of information that you give to the approximation algorithm. What we assume is that you only have this information. So but you could possibly the adaptivity gap by saying I give you the precise probability distribution because that seems sort of no 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 no. But the adaptivity gap is defined uh, for any any policy that knows that knows everything about the probability distribution. The, the definition so of the adaptivity does, gap doesn't question. have doesn't involve that. So the adaptivity gap you sort of really say the best adaptive algorithm means. I know all the probabilities. Yeah, but you don't even, you know, it's abstract. You don't say, like, how the policy works. The policy okay, is no. just an oracle. But it's like the competitive but the ratio oracle, is But the oracle yeah. still, we is, but just for the mass, we Does assume that sense? the oracle as an input gets the probability distributions for all the items. You can look at it like this. But I formally, I define an adaptive policy in this way. I say, uh, if the remaining capacity is x, and available items are these, then uh, there's a function which tells me what should I insert in that situation. You know, it's an oracle that doesn't say... No, the question is how is this an item specified for the adaptive policy? Whether for an item you just get UI, UI or yeah. for an item you get its full distribution. For the oracle. For, okay. for the oracle. For the for oracle, the for the oracle, you can... It no, okay, suppose that it knows the complete probability distribution. So the oracle does know it. That, yeah. That's all yeah. the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Sorry he about still that. uses only mu i. No. No, 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 no. The algorithm is such no, no. I should make this really clear. The algorithm uses everything. The non-adaptive algorithm uses only mu i. Right. This is the comparison. Yeah, that's the comparison. Okay, yeah. But I should say that 
really for the adaptive policy. I'm not saying how it uses knowledge or. Which answer maths is the question? So the oracle can sort of just. The input for the oracle is all the appropriate distributions. Yes. Uh, formally, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm just making this more confusing, but formally, the adaptive policy is a function that tells me, given the remaining capacity and items, given in some abstract way, I choose this. And then I compute the expected value that such a policy gets. But the and oracle is not I, allowed to get, I mean, if you just formalize it, except, I, say, I take an oracle which actually knows the value of the... No, no. no. But so it's an oracle. <laughs> this is why we give you extra time. We're actually giving ourselves extra Yeah, actually maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll explain this more carefully rather than covering everything. I, I think that's more useful. Uh, <laughs> so you have a very good adaptive strategy. So now we have... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually when... Yeah, well, what he's getting is he's getting more information on our probability distribution. It keeps shifting now to less and less knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> or understanding of something. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so here's a lemma. That's, uh, that's the basic tool that we used in the Fox paper to bound how much an adaptive policy can possibly get. And again, this doesn't involve any assumptions on the computational power of the policy. Why can't it attempt to insert whatever? I mean, it attempts and fails. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, so it's not entirely true that you can, you can achieve attempt any value you like. because you can only do that once. You know? Attempt to insert means attempt to insert uh, as long as you still have some capacity remaining. When you insert the last item... You can attempt it. I okay, can, that's I okay. okay. I should, so I should say what I really mean by this. But what this means, a policy runs until you overflow. Then you stop, and after that, you're not even allowed to attempt to insert something. That's what I mean. And in that oh, sense... was before it was attempted. So this means, basically, I count how much, yeah. I'm counting, and I call this value mass. I will talk about a mass for a set of items. That means the sum of these mu i's for such a set. I'm counting how much mass the policy attempts to insert, which means how much it inserts, counting the last item as well, the last one that overflows. But after that, the policy really stops. After that, it can't even them. Is it? Does it make well, sense? Why there is some mean value? I mean, it's mu a is smaller than two. So now this this inequality looks for like every nothing. single for every single yes, it's sequence. No, 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 it's no, no, more no. than two because I can add at most no. one. No, 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 it's some of the mu a's. It's the sum. Okay, let me explain this inequality. It's the sum of all. It's not the actual running. Time. Because this is it's deceptive how simple okay. this formula looks. But what does this actually mean? It's not the sum of mu i. No, it's yeah, smaller than one, then I add one, one no, last no, one. No, so but you can take something with the mu, which is equal to one, and it happens to run for 10% 10, uh, 10 of the time only. And then you can take another one that is equal to one, and again it runs, happens to run just 10% of the time. What well, this so the expression letting... is really high, but actually it's high probability, it's very small. Right, which is 10%. 10 yes. okay. I think that the, uh, this is a very good point, which... Uh, makes this a little confusing because a naive proof, I think that the line of reasoning that you're trying to uh, follow would tell you that the expected mean for the set of items that the policy actually inserts successfully is at most one, right? And that's not true. So let me show you an so example. So if you knew that the distribution was pretty tight, you could actually get better bounds than this. I mean, if I gave you more information on the distribution, Namely, that it was pretty concentrated because that line of reasoning is falling apart because the distribution is not so concentrated. I don't think that's the no? case, but let me show you this example okay. and maybe that will clarify this point. So here's a simple example. And it's an example where 
being adaptive doesn't help at all. So it's not even about being adaptive. Mm -hmm. You have an infinite sequence of items oops, oops, where the size is 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. Now, uh, according to the rules of the game, I'm allowed to insert a sequence of these items until one of them gets value 1. But then I'm actually allowed to insert items as long as they get value 0. That's still legal. So this is, late, this is waiting for the second success in a sequence of biased coin flips, which takes an expected number of 2 over p items. Okay? So the expected mu, and I get uh, mu equal to p for each of these items. So the expected mu that I get here is really equal to 2, counting the last item. Otherwise, I lose a little bit. But this, uh, this example also shows that even if I count the value, the mu, the mass that I actually insert successfully, I can get close to 2. Because here, the, oh, I'm sorry, the difference is only the last item mm -hmm. whose mu is equal to p. I take p arbitrarily small. Mm -hmm. So I get 2 minus p. But really, that's, uh, that's not the point here. I can get arbitrarily close to 2, even counting only the items that fit successfully. So that's one interesting fact. And 2 is the upper bound on this value. I can't get more than 2. Um, OK, and this was the basic tool that we used in the Fox paper. Let me not prove it here, because I will show you a stronger bound in some sense. Not a number smaller than 2, but a smarter bound than this. Um, so what's the improvement? Uh, the idea is that you really need an infinite sequence of items to achieve this. That's, that's why it works, that you have an infinite sequence and the value somehow converges to 2. Uh, for an instance where you have a finite amount of mass, where you have a finite number of items, you can't really get close to 2. So what's a better bound? Uh, a bound on the, the expected mass that we can get uh, when we count only items from a given set of items j looks like this. It's at most 2 times 1 minus the product of 1 minus mu j over this set of items. And this also works for any subset of items in the sense that I can restrict my attention to a subset of items and I only uh, count contributions from this subset. I run the adaptive policy, but I only count the mass that I insert from that subset. And the bound still works, because it's still an adaptive, it's a legal adaptive policy restricted to that subset of items. So this gives some bound on how much mass I can get from this subset of items. And I will try to show you how, how to prove this. Uh, since the adaptive policy is a recursive object in some sense, it's very natural to apply induction, right? So let me define this. Let me define the maximum possible expected mass that I get from a subset of items J, assuming that there's remaining capacity C. I denote that by M of J C, and I will prove this, that it's at most 1 plus C times the same factor, the same term, 1 minus, okay? So one interesting feature here is that uh, consider a special case when there's remaining capacity 0. How much can I get when there's remaining capacity 0? Well, 0, it's not 0, right? I can get, uh, I can get something if I have available items which have possible size 0. If there is some probability that the size is 0, I can insert these items as long as they get size 0. That's right. I keep thinking that the cost, that the value, and the size are related. But you can have things with positive value and zero mm -hmm. size. But so far, I'm not talking about value. So far, I'm only looking at the mass. And you can imagine that that's the value that counts. Right? That, that's my value that counts. Oh my God. So I just wanted to... So how could it help you then? 
in any way to be inserting things of zero mass. Okay, so, so I have because they may mass. have value. So there. Right, but that's what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, 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 eventually, no. eventually, that I mean, if if, if the mass and the value were equal, I would never bother to do that. Right, but it's a random size, which, which can no, be zero I, I or maybe not zero. Okay. It's a random size. Sure, no. That's zero with some probability. Sizes, yeah. And I can iterate this process as long as I get zeros. I can keep going. And I just wanted to show you that actually this bound makes sense. It's kind of easy to believe when C is equal to zero. When C is equal to zero and you have, um, you have a sequence of items which have size 1 with probability mu j right. and size 0 with probability 1 minus mu j. Then I keep inserting this sequence of items and I count the mass that I insert on the expectation and you get exactly this formula. Christian said it looks like the low mass local lemma. Yeah, yeah, all the asymmetric. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, reminiscent yeah. of that. Yeah, right. But it's, and it's structure, but also in in interpretation, if you think about it. It's not in opposite direction. You have a lower bound on In the last local lemma, you have a lower bound on the bed. Yeah. It's just that the formula looks the same. Oh, no. okay. I, I don't it's think there's any. Then it's a cluster expansion, right, which is the opposite. No, no, this I understand, but I'm, I'm okay. speaking about I don't think, that, that's inter actually the formula, I thought about it, but I don't think there's any deep connection. Okay. Um, I want to say a little bit about the proof. Now, I, I'm not going to give you the whole proof, but uh, once you get this uh, hint, then it's easy. Um, so uh, we assume that there is an optimal adaptive policy, which given a set of available items J and the remaining capacity C, it will choose a certain item, which is the optimal item to choose in that situation. And assume that that's item number one. Okay, so we can write out the expectation, the expected mass that we get. Assuming that we start by inserting item one, we get mu one for that. And then uh, in the event that the size of the first item is not greater than C, we can continue. And then we get, by induction, we get at most M of the remaining set of items and C minus S1. Okay, and now, uh, oh my god, sorry. M is a deterministic function. M is the, it's just a function of a subset and a real number. This argument C minus S1 is a random variable. But we can still apply induction to that for any specific value of S1, we can apply induction and replace M by the formula that we have here. And when you do that, uh, and you just do some more juggling with the expression that you get inside, you can actually evaluate the expectation exactly. And you get this formula. You get this formula that you want to get. So it works out very nicely. And this is the strengthened bound. The induction is on the size of the I induction is on, on the size of J, I say on the size J, of J. Exactly. Yeah, sorry, yeah, so it was I, yeah, J. Okay, any questions? <laughs> uh, so now, now we're going back to values. So far, we only talked about mass. But how can we bound the value that the adaptive policy gets? For that purpose, we write the following linear program. But you said so the values are fixed, right? The values, values are, are deterministic. Right. Okay. They are deterministic. Okay. So it's, I guess not, of course, but the values themselves. It's not like you've got another probability distribution floating around. No, no, no. You could consider that, but we have deterministic values. So that's the bound on, adaptive, on the optimal adaptive policy 
uh, that we have. And I will explain why it works. So what does the LP look like? We have the sum of WI, XI, and WI is something new that I define here. That's the value of an item multiplied by the probability that it fits. We call that effective item values. Mm -hmm. All right? And here's a hint why this LP works. XI means, XI really stands for the total probability that we insert item I. Okay? For an adaptive policy, um, the event that we insert item I can be quite complicated. You know, the policy has different branches. We can insert it under different conditions. But given the policy, there is some total probability that we insert the item. That's determined beforehand. Right? Because we just average over all the branches, there's some total probability that we ever insert the item. And that's our variable xi here. So what's the point? That for any adaptive policy, when you write down these probabilities xi, it's a feasible solution. Right? It's a feasible solution of this LP exactly because of the uh, previous bound that I gave. All right? So the sum of wi xi is the expected value that we can possibly get. We are even losing something here because we are saying that uh, if we attempt to insert item i in any situation, we get at most wi. We can actually get less if the remaining capacity is already small. wi is the maximum possible value that we can get even if uh, we haven't used any capacity at all so far. So we are losing, that, that's one place where we are losing something. But I hope I convinced you that this is an upper bound on the adaptive optimum. Mm -hmm. So now I would like to use this LP somehow to design a non-adaptive policy. And first I will actually re relax this LP. I'll make it weaker. So on the previous slide, we had uh, a condition that xi is between 0 and 1, which is true because it stands for a probability. It's a probability. Here I'm saying, let's not care about that. Let's just allow any non-negative values. And now look at this LP. Uh, look at this function here. The right-hand side, there's a very nice property that it satisfies. It's a submodular function of J. That's not obvious from this formula, but it's not very hard to verify either. Submodular function is such that when you look at two subsets, the uh, say A B, F of A union B plus F of A intersect B is at most F of A plus F of B. And this function satisfies that, which means that this LP is a linear relaxation of a polymatroid. Why is it, uh, what's the difference between a matroid and a polymatroid where, well, um, a relaxation of a matroid optimization problem is given by some submodular function which stands for the rank of the matroid. And uh, when is a function the rank of a matroid? When it's submodular and the value for any uh, element, a singleton, should be 1, which is not necessarily true here. Um, but it's a submodular function, which means that many properties, many nice properties of matroids are preserved. Namely, the greedy algorithm solves this LP exactly. So we can write, we can write the solution of this LP, this relaxed LP, in a closed form, and it's a very nice formula. It looks like this. You order the items uh, in what we call the decreasing density of value, which is kind of natural. You divide the values by the expected sizes. And then uh, the greedy algorithm for polymatroid works in such a way that it assigns, uh, in this greedy ordering, it takes as much of each item as possible so that you don't exceed the 
uh, the, the bound to the right hand side. And this is exactly what you get. So this is kind of nice because this formula, apart from the factor of two, this looks kind of like inserting Bernoulli variables and what's the probability that, that the probability that you survive up to item K? The probability is that uh, the probability that all the items so far had value zero would be exactly this. So I'm just trying to say that this formula uh, looks like the value that you would get using a greedy algorithm assuming that the, the variables are actually Bernoulli variables, zero, one variables. Plus you get this additional factor of two. But that's, that's my bound on the adaptive optimum. And that's the end of the first part. And now I will use that to design a non-adaptive policy. So what will this policy be? Take this greedy ordering and just insert items in this order. So what is the expected value that we get in this way? Actually, first, let me look at the same question that we answered for adaptive policies, namely, what is the expected mass that we attempt to insert? Which means the sum, which means a sum that looks like this. Mu k, p k minus one. p k minus one is the probability that we survive up to the kth item. And now this is getting interesting. What can be the probability that a sum of k random variables like this is at most one. Well, one way to bound it is uh, to use a Markov bound, which is basically what we did in the Fox paper. And that gives you the bound of seven, uh, roughly speaking. So here we estimate the probability that we survive up to item k by one minus the expect expected size of the k minus one previous items. Okay. But actually we prove something stronger here. We prove that the expected mass that we insert looks like this. Uh, and why is this nice? This looks very much like the LP that we had on the previous slide. And I'm not going to prove this inequality here. I can prove it for you on the blackboard if you want. But this, this is pretty interesting now. What's, what's the interesting uh, connection here? So in the last talk, there was a very nice talk uh, <laughs> where uh, Real Feige asked the question, uh, and I'm basically I'm scaling everything here uh, by one over n. But the question is, when you have uh, random variables whose expectations are one over n, and you take n minus one of them, so the expectation of the sum is n minus one over n, so it's just below one. What can be the probability uh, that you exceed one? Namely, what can be, in other words, what can be the minimum probability that the sum is at most one? Uh, so Uriel proves that it's at most, at least one over 13, the probability that the sum is below one. So what if you replace n minus one by n plus k, where k could be positive or negative? Uh, if, even if you replace it by n, then you can have, uh, then it can be zero or arbitrarily close to zero, you can have, there's really a, a phase transition there or something. Because when it's a little bit below one, you get this positive constant. And when the, the expectation of the sum is one, or if it's one plus epsilon, then you can have deterministic variables that are always bigger than one. The sum is always bigger than one. So you drop to zero suddenly. Right? So. Um, so if you replace n minus 1 by n minus 2, n minus 3, and so on, do you get better bounds? Uh, 
the same now. If n tends to infinity, if n tends to infinity. it's the same now. Now, if you have n minus 1 and the expectation is 1 over n, then you get the same bound. When the expectations are 1, o 1 over n and you sum up k of them, then I guess you should get you should get something like e to the minus k over n. At some point, you can move to Markov's inequality where the number of variables is so small that the inequality gives you something better. If the expectation of the sum, let's say, is half of the whole sum, then of course the probability that you're below 1 is at least half. Yeah, so once you get really far away, then you can get better things. But so this is good when you are very close to 1. n minus k just gives you the same amount. Yeah, if k is in the k is not doesn't scale with, with yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So it's at least 1 minus k over n by Markov's law. But actually, it could be something like 1 minus 1 over n to the k. That would be nice. But it's not clear, but so what does our inequality say about this? And Uriel actually believes that it's 1 over e. Uh, so we prove, now let me go back here, this inequality. Now plug in mu k equal to 1 over n. We get that. Uh, The average of the first n pk's, of the first n probabilities, is roughly 1 minus 1 over e. So, so let me plot it like this. Here's a 1. This is x. And on this axis, we would have the probability that uh, the probability that the first k variables are at most 1. And here, x is equal to k over n. So this bound, if this is true, I think this should be true. If it's true, then the function looks like this. It's an exponential that decreases from 1 down to 1 over e here. What we prove that the area under this curve is exactly what it should be, 1 minus 1 over e. And uh, unfortunately, it's not clear. So. So from the, from the proof, there's some bound that we get for each pk separately. But it doesn't seem to imply this. Only the, when you sum up all of them, it gives you a nice bound. That's interesting. But uh, yeah, I don't have time to show you the proof here. But I'm sure we can talk about it. Um, yeah, th this is. Um, one more comment on this. We prove that a sum like this, that an inequality holds for a sum of n terms like this. But it's not true that one by one uh, the inequality holds. You mean it's not true that you can prove that it's false? So this is not true. This is false for some examples. So here. Uh, we have a little bit more general scenario where you have arbitrary expectations. You're saying, let's make all of them equal to 1 over n. It might be true when you have expectations 1 over n. But for arbitrary expectations mu j like this, it's not true. I can show you the example. It doesn't seem uh, to work like that. But uh, are you assuming that these random variables are independent? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, maybe I didn't emphasize that. 
Sorry, that's very important. So I don't know. This is a pretty basic question about uh, some of And they can be negative as well, I assume. Uh, no, these are non-negative. So it's the variable. So it's independent and mm -hmm. non-negative. In independent. Yeah, I'm sorry. This statement is not very precise here, but uh, they are the same kinds of random variables that we had so far. So non-negative, and you can actually assume that you truncate them at one. It's kind of it's the same uh, mm -hmm. setting. Yeah. No, I mean, so one on one, no, there's, there's certainly no need to truncate it at one. I mean, that, that, that would, would follow. I mean, that, that is, yeah, because that's the bad, because you have one minus. So in, in your assumptions, you don't do No. OK. But, but you need non-negative independent. I need non-negative independent. Yeah, so I don't have much more to say about this. But now let me show you how it, apply, how it implies a factor of four for the stochastic knapsack problem, where we simply take this greedy ordering and we insert items in this order. So now we know that for any uh, prefix of R items, when you take the first R items, we can write the inequality that we had, and we know the expected mass that we try to insert out of these first R items. And it's at least a formula like this. Now, from here, uh, and using the greedy ordering here, it's pretty easy to see that we can write a similar inequality for the expected value that we attempt to insert. It's the same formula. You just replace mu k's by W case here. And that's exactly one half of the LP bound that we have. So why, why is the adaptivity gap not 2? Why is it 4 and not 2? Well, the, the catch here is that we count the last item that overflows as well. And we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. We get this nice bound, and that's another interesting point here in this inequality, when you sum, when you take the sum of mu k times p k, you don't get a nice formula. You get a nice formula when you sum mu k multiplied by p k minus 1. You have to shift one of, one of the two sequences and then they fall in place nicely and everything works out. Uh, and this corresponds to the expected mass that we attempt to insert. And this corresponds to the expected value that we attempt to insert. So we have to do one last argument, and that's the following. Uh, how much can we lose by not counting the last item? Well, we have to subtract that, and it's at most the maximum possible wi for all items, right? So if there's any item such that its uh, effective value is at least lp over 4, then we just take this item alone and we insert it, and we are within factor of 4. If not, then all items are bounded by LP or 4. And in that case, the last one that we, we cheated, we counted something that we shouldn't have. But that's at most LP over 4. So LP over 2 minus LP over 4 gives you LP over 4. And that's how you get factor 4. Um, so that's it. That's factor 4. Um, a little bit more. OK. Um, so a few final remarks on the stochastic knapsack before I move on to the next part. Uh, we proved that this is a four approximation algorithm, and it's tight in the sense that this particular algorithm could be as bad as adapt over four. So the analysis is tight. Not only that, using this LP, and even the first LP, not the relaxed one, but the uh, the first LP that I showed you, you can't prove a bound better than 4, because this LP could be actually uh, 4 times more than the actual LP. So there's a gap of 4 inherent in this LP. Uh, another fact is that in the model where I only 
give expected item sizes to the policy and I don't allow it to see anything else, I can't beat uh, the factor of three. And that's basically uh, by an example where you have two kinds of items that you can't distinguish. If you only see the mean sizes, you can't distinguish these two types. And therefore, being this limited policy, you don't know which one you should pick. But the difference between choosing the right one and the bad one can be a factor of three. And that's, uh, that's a simple example where one, one item type has uh, deterministic size 1 half plus epsilon. And the other item type has uh, size 0 or 1 with probability 1 half plus epsilon. Okay, so in this case, you can get only 1. But here, you get something like 3 on the expectation. You insert. Uh, why do you get 3? Well, first, I keep inserting until I get size 1. It will take me an expected number of two items to do that. Then I repeat that, and I get two more, so that's four, but I counted the last one that I shouldn't have counted. So I get three. So there's a factor of three between these two instances that I can't distinguish if I only see mean item sizes. And I don't know if that's, if that's best possible. I tried to do four, but couldn't do that. The lower bound of 1.25 seems ridiculous. And that should be better, but I have no idea how to search for good examples. And also, using this uh, analysis, we can get a 3 plus epsilon approximation algorithm for, um, OK, we can get an adaptive approximation algorithm, which has a factor of 3 plus epsilon. But that's using more information on the probability distributions. So here, we partition items into small, means very small, smaller than some epsilon, and bigger than epsilon. And for these large items, basically, we do an exhaustive search where you get a horrible polynomial complexity. Uh, it's polynomial for fixed epsilon, but it's horrible. And this part of the algorithm uses the complete uh, density function of, of the probability distribution. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just stop here. I, I don't know. I covered only the first part, but maybe I'll just stop. You can tell us. You're, you're meeting many of us well. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, we realized that his schedule was too long.